This is a Global News special presentation. Good morning, Canada. It is about to kick off. The 43rd federal election campaign will get underway within minutes. We are waiting for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to walk into Rideau Hall in Ottawa, the official residence of the Governor General, and ask her to dissolve Parliament, which will begin the process of issuing the writs of election. A writ is that formal written order that instructs the returning officer in every electoral district to hold an election to elect a member of Parliament. And in this country, there are 338 of them and whoever wins a majority of those seats forms the next government, unless, of course, no single party gets a majority, in which case we'll have a minority government, which is something certainly in play this year. We're going to continue to watch Rideau Hall there. Hello, I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for joining us. We're so happy you could be with us on this Wednesday morning, whether you're watching us on TV, online, or listening to us on Global News Radio. If you're a political junkie, there are lots of them in this country, this is your moment. The country is in for 40 days and 40 nights of nonstop political drama. And if you're not into politics, hey, look, I, I get it, but Here's my pledge to you. We are here to make this whole process as informative, as interesting, and as painless as we can so that you are armed with as much information as we can deliver to help you decide who to vote for. And in the end, of course, your vote counts. That's what this is all about. Every single vote counts. It's your country. This is your chance to play a role in who runs it. It is a privilege and a right Billions of people this year. Mike Lukatur is in London, Ontario, where the NDP leader Jagmeet Singh is this morning. And Richard Zussman is in Victoria, B.C. That's where Green Party leader Elizabeth May will be kicking off the Green campaign. And our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, is in Winnipeg, my hometown, yay, because he was involved in uh, provincial election coverage there last night. And in our Ottawa studio, we have some wise political minds, liberal strategist Richard Mahoney, NDP strategist Anne McGrath, Jean-Luc Cook is president of the Green Party and a candidate in this election. And in Toronto, we have conservative strategist Fred Delory. Also in Toronto, pollster Daryl Bricker from Ipsos. And with me here in Vancouver is Charles Adler, host of Charles Adler Tonight on the Global News Radio Network. Hi there, Charles. Hey. So let's start with Mercedes Stevenson at Rideau Hall. Mercedes, we have fixed election dates now. We knew the date was going to be October 21st. We just didn't know when the campaign would officially start. Why today, September 11th? What kind of calculation goes into picking the start date for a campaign? Well, that's a great question. It's whenever the parties believe it will be more advantageous, the party in power. So they're looking at internal polls. They're looking at do they have something they want to drop on the opposition or perhaps something they want to have avoid being dropped on them. And there was an awful lot of speculation around this, Donna. People thought they might go on Sunday. Then there was the hurricane out in Atlantic Canada. They thought perhaps this coming Sunday, and the reason why Sunday is that's traditional. It's usually on a Sunday morning. They couldn't do it on the same day as the Manitoba election. And a lot of people thought they wouldn't do it on 9-11. But obviously they think that that will not be a calculation for voters when they ultimately cast their ballots on October 21st. Uh, one of the interesting things I'm sure the Prime Minister is going to be asked about today is that report in the Globe and Mail alleging that the RCMP were looking into potential obstruction of justice in the SNC-Lavalin scandal and were not able to ask questions or uh, obtain documents from certain witnesses uh, because of cabinet confidence. They will have to suspend that investigation once an election starts if it was indeed underway. So there'll be questions about whether that may have been a factor. They didn't want to go for as long as the Conservatives did. That, remember, uh, nine-week campaign in 2015 doesn't tend to turn out well for incumbents. But they also didn't go for the shortest possible time. So here we are, 40 days from Election Day. And Mercedes political junkies are saying they think this could be perhaps the most dynamic, most unpredictable election in a long time because there are five parties running nationally, six in Quebec. What's your sense of what we're in for? Well, the term that I've heard from every major political party is the Wild West, that this is going to be a Wild West election. No one knows what's going to happen, and that's true of any campaign. If you look back to 2015, people thought it was really Tom Mulcair's election to lose, and instead you ended up with Justin Trudeau, who was in third place, coming in with a majority government. So anything can blow up on the campaign trail, but here are some key differences with this election. Number one, the NDP potentially falling out of third place. Number two, the Green Party really emerging 
positioning as a national party that could become very serious and potentially hold the balance of power if there's a minority government. Beyond that, you have social media, powerful in a way that it never has been before. One tweet can go viral within seconds, and we have the existence of third parties, groups like Canada Proud, that aren't political parties, but they are trying to influence the outcome of the election. And that's where we also see things like disinformation and concerns about foreign influence that we really haven't seen in Canadian elections before. All right, Mercedes Stevenson. Uh, outside Rideau Hall, we're going to come back to you. Uh, let's go to David Aiken, our chief political correspondent, who, as I said, is in Winnipeg, uh, where the provincial Conservatives uh, won a second majority government there in an election last night. That will be a boost, of course, for the federal Conservatives as they head into this campaign. David, you've seen how much the tide can turn in a single campaign. Um, we watched that happen in 2015 with Justin Trudeau. Turns out 78 days was uh, great for him because he was able to go from underdog to prime minister. How much do campaigns matter in 2019? Cam campaigns matter a whole lot. I mean, that's why they do them. And certainly think about to that 2015 campaign. We thought Thomas Mulcair was going to be prime minister in the summer of 2015. He was leading the polls. He was doing very well. But of course, in 2015, there was an appetite for change. And eventually the campaign for the liberals mattered. They were very effective in 2015, primarily using social media, Facebook, that sort of thing to find voters, get them out to the polls. That was uh, even the conservatives will concede that they got out campaigned online. It's going to be a little different this time. Uh, Trudeau has going to have to defend a record that's a bit dodgy. Mercedes was just talking about this RCMP SNC-Lavalin investigation. That's going to be weighing on them. The Conservatives are smart and they've got a lot of money. They have the most money of anybody in this campaign. They're going to use it to be very targeted with online ads, ads on television networks, and as I think we've all heard, They've actually got someone to write a song. The guy who helps Brian Adams write a song has been hired to write their campaign song. So they're spending money uh, everywhere they can because campaigns matter. Uh, we're just going to come back to you in a sec, uh, David. We're watching the Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, and his wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, uh, walking hand in hand to the uh, Governor General's residence, Rideau Hall. And he will go inside for this appointment with I, the Governor General, who us. will... Uh, dissolve the 42nd Parliament and issue the writs for the next federal election, which will begin, I guess, the moment those writs are issued. So that's a, this is a formal process that takes part, camera uh, takes place, camera is not allowed in there as this happens. Uh, we do expect, though, the Prime Minister will emerge and not too long from now and uh, come out and uh, set the tone for the for the campaign and take some questions as well. We're going to hear from all of the party leaders uh, today after the campaign uh, is officially launched. David, let's go back to you. Uh, what do you, having having covered all of the um, the ups and downs through this uh, prime minister's four years in office, what do you think is his greatest vulnerability as he heads into this campaign? I think that uh, the Liberals are most vulnerable from the left side, on the progressive side. Listen, they're still working with Stephen Harper's climate change targets. Four years ago, Prime Minister Trudeau promised electoral reform. That's a real favorite with Green and NDP voters. He's been slow to take action on pay equity. I could go down the list on things on the left side of the spectrum that he's vulnerable on. That's where I think it's, it's going to be toughest for him. He is blessed in a sense right now that the parties on the left are really fighting over fourth place. That's the New Democrats. They're broke, and, and we heard they, they still need 130 candidates. Uh, and the Green Party is moving up. It's a strengthened Green Party, but uh, you know if they win four seats, that would be a real surprise. So Trudeau's lucky in that sense that he's not going to see a very sustained attack on his left flank. And I think, as I say, that's where he's chiefly vulnerable. If the Conservatives start talking about the promises broken on deficits, debt reduction, that sort of thing, I don't think they're going to get a lot of traction with voters. We saw that, I think, in 2015, that mild deficits, which is what we still have, relatively speaking, uh, voters will by and large shrug. So tough for the Conservatives. They're going to have a hard time chipping away at Trudeau's right flank. He's wide open on the left flank. All right, David Aiken, thank you. As we uh, watch uh, for the Prime Minister to emerge from uh, Rideau Hall, let's go to our uh, 
Mike LeCouture, who is in London, Ontario today. He'll be covering the NDP uh, campaign. He is with uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. Mike, uh, Jagmeet Singh only recently won a seat in the House of Commons. He is the underdog going into this campaign. Does he see himself that way? Yeah, he definitely does. And all of this talk that we've heard so far throughout the shore by Mercedes and David saying that the underdogs in the last two elections were really the ones that came up uh, and outperformed the others is music to the ears of the NDP. In fact, Charlie Angus, uh, you know, one of those stalwarts of the NDP, most recently said this feels a lot like 2011, where everybody count the, counted them out as the third place party. The problem is, though, if you look at the polls and the reality on the ground is, it doesn't look like they're going to emerge from third place whatsoever. Uh, some have even dubbed this the Save the Furniture Tour because of where they're going and how they're going about it. Consider this, Donna, they've got a plane for this campaign, this national campaign, for only 30 of the 40 days. The rest of the time, they're going to be on a bus. And they say that it's to concentrate in areas like southwestern Ontario, where we are now, lower BC uh, mainland and of course Vancouver Island. Those are all areas where the NDP is extremely strong uh, and whether or not they're actually going to try and spread their wings and gain too many seats is really the question but whether or not he sees himself as uh, as the underdog I think the expectations are extremely low for Jagmeet Singh right now and he probably relishes that uh, and trying to prove a lot of people wrong whether or not though he will connect with voters uh, and whether or not he can grow the seat count here is another question altogether. Uh, there are some rumblings uh, of you know, getting the seats up to 26. That's actually down from 44, where we are right now, Donna. Uh, so they do have that underdog mentality. In fact, the back of his bus is the back of Jugmeet Singh's with his hands raised, almost like Rocky, wearing a, a leather jacket. So he's trying to fully embrace that underdog mentality. And whether or not he'll win the fight on October 21st is another question altogether. You know, um, Mike, uh, David Aiken mentioned that the NDP still needs to nominate 130 candidates. Is that number? Did I hear that right? We just heard from the party today. They have 253 as of today. They're hoping uh, as of September 13th on Friday to have 271. Anybody who can do the math knows that's well short of the 338 that you need for a full roster. Uh, trying to get people to join the NDP is a real question. Will they just be filling uh, their roster with a number of paper candidates? That's a possibility. The, par the party promised they won't be just paper candidates. Remember, famously, Ruth Ellen Brosseau in Berthier Masquenonger was the one, uh, that one famous one during the orange wave of 2011, who was a paper candidate and won. Don't think that's going to happen in this election, uh, but they are having a really difficult time fundraising and recruiting candidates. Uh, and anybody who knows politics knows that's a real problem, especially during an election campaign. All right. Mike LeCouture with the NDP campaign in Ontario uh, for now. Uh, thank you. Let's go to Richard Zussman in Victoria. He's with uh, the Green campaign. That's Elizabeth May will be making her uh, debut in the campaign in Victoria. It's a real um, stronghold for the Green Party, which has become a provincial force across this country, electing um, uh, MLAs in a number of provinces, more of a force uh, politically in this country than it's ever been, Richard. Uh, federally, what really are the hopes for the Green Party in this election? Donna, the Greens say they're running a coast-to-coast -coast campaign, but really this is a campaign focused on the coasts, especially here in Vancouver Island. You mentioned provincially, the Greens hold the balance of power in the B.C. legislature with three MLAs. The party is targeting every federal seat on Vancouver Island. There are six seats right now. The Greens hold two of them. Uh, those are six that they have their eyes on. There will be a lot of time spent here. Those two MPs are obviously Elizabeth May, the leader, and Paul Manley, who recently won in a by-election. The party is optimistic that they can can make inroads here on Vancouver Island. Then you go all the way to the other part of the country where the party has their eye on Prince Edward Island, where right now they are the official opposition in the provincial legislature there. They have hopes in three of the four ridings in PEI. They also have eyes in New Brunswick, where they have three provincial representatives. Again, these are all breakthroughs for the Greens, who a decade ago had just one representative in Elizabeth May across the country. And so they're 
focused in federally on New Brunswick. The one blip is Ontario, where uh, Mike Schreiner won as an MPP in Ontario in Guelph. The party in Elizabeth May will be focused there during the federal election to hopefully pick that up federally as well. It's been a rough week, though, Donna, for the Greens. A lot of these sort of hot-button issues have come up, and Elizabeth May keeps talking about how if anybody's elected for the Greens, they will have free vote. So Pierre Nantel, who is now a Green MP in Quebec, came out yesterday saying that he would vote very quickly for Quebec to separate if he could, and there should be another vote. Uh, you know, national unity obviously isn't on the ballot here, but it's one of those issues that will... Uh, come after Elizabeth May through this campaign as she's asked about rogue statements made from candidates across the country through the campaign. All right, Richard Zussman in Victoria with the Green Party campaign. Thank you so much. Well, there are no lawn signs up yet, but wait for it. They will be soon. If you're involved in po politics, you know the unofficial campaign, of course, has been underway all summer long. The party platforms are not all out yet, but some pre-campaign ads are, and they lay out the slogans and the themes of what's to come. Here's a taste of them. I got into politics to help people, like the people I've served here in Papineau for more than a decade. People who work hard to make ends meet. Parents who want to build a better life for their kids. Canadians who want our country to stand for something positive in a world that's grown darker. Conservative politicians have a different approach. When we raised taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could cut them for the middle class, they tried to stop us. When we created the Canada Child Benefit that gives hundreds of dollars a month tax-free to regular families across the country, they tried to stop that too. And now we've got a real climate plan that will reduce pollution and put more money in your pockets, and they're even trying to fight that. The Conservatives like to say they're for the people, but then they cut taxes for the wealthy and cut services for everybody else. In October, we've got a choice to make. Keep moving forward and build on the progress we've made, or go back to the politics of the Harper years. I am for moving forward for everyone. My plan for Canadians? Lower the cost of living and leave more money in your pockets. I believe that Canadians across this country are so frustrated because they're working so hard and they're following all the rules, but they feel like they're falling further and further behind or that they're barely getting by. I have a plan to lower the cost of living, to make life more affordable, to leave more money in the pockets of Canadians for their kids, for themselves, or for their aging parents. Because it's time for you to get ahead. People tell me I'm different from the other leaders, and I am. I don't work for the wealthy and well-connected. I don't think government should be run for their benefit, like it has for decades. I believe that government should work for all of us. Investing in healthcare, cutting costs for families, and tackling the climate crisis. Not just saying the right things, but actually doing them. Now that's different. We're going to dig into those election ads and, and some of the party platforms with some strategists in, much, in just a moment. We want to remind you, you are watching live coverage of uh, election uh, decision, I guess, 43. We're uh, about to kick off the 43rd federal election campaign. And you, we welcome all of you who are watching online, listening on the radio, or watching us on TV across the country. Let's go to our Abigail Beeman, who is with the conservative leader, Andrew Scheer. We wanted to check in on that that campaign. His campaign plane is already in the air and we've just been told that it was headed to Trois-Rivières, Quebec, but has been rerouted. Uh, it has to land in Quebec City because of fog. So uh, right out of the blocks, the Conservatives running into a little bit of trouble, not getting to the destination that they'd hoped. Our Abigail Beeman is on the campaign plane. She hopped on board at Ottawa Airport and she recorded this just before she left. Donna, Andrew Shear heads to both Quebec and Ontario today, hitting two key battlegrounds on day one of the campaign. The Conservatives will launch their campaign in Trois-Rivières. Now, this is a seat that the Conservatives have not held for decades, but it's one they've had their eye on for a while. It has been 
held by the NDP since the orange wave of 2011, and the incumbent is running again. But the conservative candidate is well known, a former mayor for that city. Now, the overall message of the conservative campaign is around affordability. The campaign slogan, it's time for you to get ahead. And you will hear Andrew Scheer talking about how he plans to make daily life more affordable for Canadians over and over again throughout the campaign for the next few weeks. After Quebec, Sheer heads to Woodbridge, Ontario. That is a riding that the Liberals won narrowly in 2015, and it's part of a key battleground that you'll hear about over and over throughout this campaign. The 905, the seats around Toronto or the greater Toronto area. Conservatives will spend a lot of time there trying to win back seats they lost to the Liberals in 2015. Back to you, Donna. All right, Abigail Beeman, thanks. Well, the point of campaigns is to convince you a certain candidate and a certain party has the best plan for running the country. It is the party strategists who help plan how to do that and communicate the platform, figure out a way to win your vote. Let's go to our panel of wise political minds and strategists. Uh, we've just seen the ads and all the parties want to be seen as in it for the little guy, being uh, seen as in touch with what the people want. All of them are already busy attacking their opponents too, sometimes saying things that aren't actually true as much as putting forward their own ideas. Richard Mahoney, let's start with you. The liberal slogan is choose forward. But the ad that's come out already keeps looking back. Uh, Trudeau even mentions the previous prime minister, Stephen Harper, uh, a number of times. You know, Justin Trudeau beat him last time. Why can't he just let that go and, and really move forward? Well, because I think election campaigns are about choices. And in the liberal strategy to talk about choosing forward, uh, what you're setting up is a choice for Canadians, a choice between building on the progress that Mr. Trudeau's had over the last few years, the focus on the child benefit, put more money in people's hands, uh, putting raising taxes on the well-to-do to finance that, uh, dealing with the challenges of climate change, as opposed to what Mr. Scheer and the Conservatives represent, which is really a continuation of what the Harper years were. So that's a choice, and I think you'll hear that, Donna, throughout the campaign, not just this week, but uh, right until October 21st. Elections are about choices, and you can expect Mr. Trudeau to highlight that. All right, Fred Delory in Toronto, what's the strategy to broaden the Conservative tent and coax enough voters to take a chance on Andrew Scheer? Will you be touting his skills and policies or, or spend a lot of time attacking his opponent, Justin Trudeau? be talking about uh, their plan uh, to make Canada more affordable uh, to help families and individuals. Of course, it's uh, it's a challenge to not always talk about uh, Mr. Trudeau's problems that he continually continuously falls into. Uh, we found out today that the RCMP is investigating uh, obstruction of justice uh, of Mr. Trudeau and his government. Uh, and Canadians are going to want to be talking about that, we're sure. But we want to stick to the positive as much as we can. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shear is going to travel the country. He's going to be uh, talking to voters across uh, across the coast. Uh, one of the interesting things is we've already uh, knocked on over four million doors. We've had individual conversations with Canadians and our local campaign teams are ready to continue hitting those doors and talking to people. And that's what our focus is going to be. Just to fact check that a little bit, I think the RCMP is looking into potential obstruction of justice, Not has not launched an official investigation, uh, just to clarify the Globe and Mail story. But how does, how does the Conservative Party broaden the tent? Um, what is it, do you think, that Andrew Scheer brings to the table that can do that that Stephen Harper didn't? Well, I mean, uh, Mr. Harper was uh, Canada's sixth longest serving uh, prime minister, so um, let's not uh, forget that he was very successful. For sure, but, but he, uh, lo he lost the last election. Correct. Uh, Mr. Scheer will be uh, will, will be presenting a very um, forward-thinking platform during this campaign. It will be fully costed and budgeted. Uh, he's going to put that out, and it'll be very appealing to, to uh, Canadians and to his messages. It's going to be focused on putting uh, money back in Canadians' pockets to by lowering taxes and helping the, uh, every Canadian that, that that they can. All right, and Anne McGrath, the New Democrats are not in exactly a strong position as this campaign kicks off. Uh, a lot of candidates still not nominated in ridings. Uh, in some polls, the Greens are now coming out ahead of the NDP. What's the strategy to turn things around for the NDP? Well, first of all, I have to say that election campaigns, <coughs> excuse me, are a really good opportunity to sort of level the playing field and uh, give Canadians an opportunity 
to see the leaders in a, a less mediated way than uh, than between elections. I thought that the campaign ads were all actually quite good uh, and lay out the issues very well. Um, and you can see that uh, Jagmeet Singh's campaign is going to be focused on uh, talking about whose side whose side we're on. And I think that uh, Canadians know the NDP. Uh, they know what we fight for. They know what we stand for. We know. They know who we stand with, and I think his campaign is going to really highlight that. He is very warm and, in, and has a kind of a, a, a very good uh, way with people. He's very engaging, and, and his enthusiasm is infectious. So I think Canadians are going to get their first impression of him in this campaign, and they're going to like what they see, and they're going to see that he is, uh, he is in it for them. I think that the slogan is perfectly appropriate. With respect to uh, any of the challenges that the... Uh, that the party faces right now, uh, you know, I've been in a lot of campaigns and uh, money has never been our, you know, we've never gone into a campaign flush with money. Sometimes have been better than others, but certainly I have seen campaigns where we have been outspent significantly and still done better than people expected. So I, you know, while I accept that there are some challenges there, I believe that we will overcome them. And, with res and, and regarding the number of candidates, um, you know, you, you talked before about paper candidates. I don't think there is any party that hasn't had paper candidates in the past. And in some cases, those so-called paper candidates have not only won, but have gone on to be re-elected time after time and been excellent representatives for their parties and for their constituents. All right, Anne McGrath, thanks. Let me go to Jean-Luc Cook from the Green Party. Jean-Luc, your party is the one with uh, apparent momentum going into this campaign. The Greens are polling higher than ever before in this country. You need to translate that into votes, and that means drawing votes from other parties. Who are you targeting predominantly? It varies from writing to writing. Um, we have some writings which are uh, traditional liberal strongholds, where we're obviously we're drawing a lot of support from there. Um, Honestly, the Green Party sees Canadians as not being partisan. Uh, the vast majority of Canadians don't uh, subscribe to either uh, or any political party. So we are really going after the voters who aren't committed, who aren't locked in. Uh, voters who are looking for, for a change. Um, they don't want to hear uh, the banter of uh, different political parties. They want to know how the country is going to move forward, um, address the major challenges of our time, climate change being one. Uh, electoral reform would be a great way to, uh, to address that. And I think that uh, the, the Green Party slogan really reflects this. Uh, not left, not right, forward together. Um, my, my colleagues here, uh, whatever the result of the election, it looks like a probable minority government, uh, the Green Party is going, to, is going to need to work with all the political parties to, uh, to, to, to tackle these problems. All right, Jean-Luc Cook, thanks, and thank you to all our strategists. We'll keep you holding there as we wait for uh, the Prime Minister to emerge from Rideau Hall. And uh, the writs have finally been issued and the campaign is underway. Before we get to that, I want to thank you all for joining us for this live news special on Global News and on Global Radio. We're being simulcast. Uh, Global Radio is the home of Charles Adler, who has his uh, Charles Adler Tonight program, and he's joining us uh, as part of our pre-election coverage. Charles, so good that you could be here. Um, can you give us your sense of who benefits most from a 40-day campaign, shorter than the one uh, four years ago? Who has, in your view, the advantage going into this? The, the advantage uh, when it's a short campaign is the incumbent. So in this case, it's Justin Trudeau's liberals. The, the fact that they wanted to uh, get it almost as close as possible to the five weeks, which is the minimum, which would have been this coming Sunday, shows you that there's a little bit of a trepidation in the Trudeau camp. Don, in the segment that you just did, what was most fascinating to me was the conservative strategist, because right out of the gate, he was talking about obstruction of justice. You naturally uh, did your job and, and corrected him in saying they, they weren't doing a, an obstruction. The RCMP wasn't doing an obstruction of justice investigation. They were poking around to see if there ought to be one. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's what the conservative party will be talking about on both social media and conventional media planting the seed that the Trudeau government is corrupt and I think corruption is a word that plays very well in the conservative camp certainly with the conservative base and you know the 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 wounds that the Liberal Party have suffered in the last year uh, last four years have been largely self-inflicted the SNC uh, saga chief among them that the, the the opposition only had to sit back and watch it unfold Look, uh, you know, the, uh, the opposition is blessed with a woman who is not a member of the opposition, Jody Wilson-Raybould. 
she's out there. The media constantly wants to interview her. Uh, she's got a lot of credibility. She had a lot of credibility at that committee hearing. Most Canadians got to see either the in entire testimony that she offered or sound bites of it. Uh, they're still very available and uh, they get downloaded a lot on, on YouTube. So the fact that Jody Wilson-Raybould did what she did, and it would appear from the latest Globe and Mail story, it would confirm that there is a there there, that it wasn't just a spat between Jody Wilson-Raybould and the Prime Minister and the fact that Jane Philpott also left also adds to all of it. But I think it'll be impossible for the Prime Minister to go through this 40-day campaign without being peppered with questions from the media and, of course, during the, the one English debate that he's agreed to and the, the two French debates. I think SNC-Lavalin was behind them. They, they thought it was, but I think it's, it's very much front and center right now. You know, I want to ask you two things about that. One, you, you talk to a lot of listeners on your radio show across the country. How many people were paying attention to the detail of that SNC-Lavalin story? Because, let's face it, there was a lot of detail and a lot of nuance, and you had to get deep into the weeds to kind of fully understand what deferred prosecution agreements are and all of that. And secondly, how many people have already made up their minds? You know, there are a lot of liberals who say, well, people have made up their minds already. We don't really need to convince anybody else because people have decided. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic question. The reason it's a fantastic question is because there is no body today, not yours truly or anyone else, who can give you a really, really solid answer. We'll get Daryl Bricker on shortly from Ipsos, and he'll give us some sense of it. But the, the idea that we know what's on people's minds, that they've made up their minds, that's why elections are so fascinating. Well, that's why this is the, the gray cup of uh, politics. We won't know whether they've made up their minds on this or anything else until October 21st. And the other question is, so you're a disaffected liberal who has voted last time. And the turnout last time was 68, I think 68 percent, almost 69 percent, which is very big for a federal election. A lot of that driven by young voters and people who were energized by the liberal campaign and by Justin Trudeau. If you're now disaffected and not sure you want to park your vote there, or, where do you go? This is another fascinating question for the campaign because uh, the Greens this week were a complete mess, whether it was the, the, the hot button of abortion, even separatism came up yesterday, so the Greens uh, seem to be all over the map. The NDP don't even have candidates in a third of their, their writings, and so you've got nowhere for them to go safely. No, nowhere a progressive voter dis disaffected with the Liberals can go and feel really, really safe that the Greens or the NDP have any kind of shot at power. And when you're a, a voter, generally, you want your vote to count. Voting for parties that are not likely to be part of the power play uh, aren't terribly interesting, unless people do start to believe, and we'll find out in the coming weeks, whether or not there's a good chance of a minority government. If there's a good chance of a minority government, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see uh, some progressive voters disaffected with the Liberals go to either the, the Greens or the NDP. At the moment, I'd say the Greens have the best shot at picking up voters, and one reason for that is Elizabeth May. I think Elizabeth May is one of the most popular political personalities in the country, and despite the, the, the gaffes this week, I would still give her uh, the lead here, especially after the debate. I think Elizabeth uh, May is a fabulous debater, and I think she'll acquit herself extremely well in the English language debate. And she is now the veteran going into this federal campaign, right? She's yeah. been at it the longest yeah. compared to the other two. I think she's a relatively safe place for a, a progressive to park a vote, if, if they're not happy with Justin Trudeau. But, you know, a, a big discussion among all progressive voters will be, do you want four more years of Harper? Because that's how it's perceived that the Conservatives will bring back Harper. Well, those progressive voters who wanted to throw Harper the heck out that's going to be a very important question for them. And they will, if they're not happy with Trudeau, many of them will hold their nose and say, vote for Trudeau anyway, vote for the Liberals, because they don't want the Conservatives to come back. You know, there are a lot of people who think maybe a minority government's not a bad thing for this country, right? The average Canadian, I don't care whether it's West, East, or Middle, likes the idea of limiting power. And they believe that whether they're Conservatives who are running the show or, or Liberals, that they perform better, they're more accountable to the public when the gun is literally to their heads every day in a minority situation. Mm. All right, lots to uh, happen in the next 40 days. Uh, Charles, we're going to come back to you. Thanks. Um, uh, Charles mentioned Daryl Bricker, uh, so we're going to go uh, to Daryl from Ipsos because he's kind of got his finger on the pulse of uh, what Canadians are thinking and feeling as much as anybody in this country. Um, polling, of course, doesn't tell the whole story, but it gives us a bit of a snapshot of where people are at and what issues are important. 
Daryl, in, in the work that you've been doing in the lead up to this campaign, what issues have risen to the top uh, for Canadians? There's been five that say people say are the most important issues. Number one is health care, probably won't play a big role in the campaign. Number two is affordability, which all of the parties are, are talking about right now. Number three relates to taxes, which is really a subset of issue number two. Uh, social inequality is a big issue in the minds of the public, so progressive voters will be very interested in hearing party answers on that. And interestingly enough, given the focus of some of the advertising we looked at, climate change is number five. Climate change, uh, it, could that be the sleeper of this campaign? For a lot of people, it is the dominant uh, issue. It is the only issue for uh, someone like Elizabeth May and the Green Party. But uh, could it rise um, from where you're finding it at, at number five to, to much more uh, prominent in this campaign? Well, it depends on whether the parties want to talk about it. Interestingly enough, prior to SNC-Lavalin and some of the things that have happened over the last couple of months, uh, I was anticipating that it would be a, a pretty big issue. You've got one side of the equation, the progressive side that wants to talk about the carbon, and you've got the conservatives on the other side that want to talk about the tax. And they really wanted to have that fight. Uh, but what's, it seems to have uh, petered out a little bit uh, on, in the run-up to the election. Now, given where the Green Party is going with, uh, with their position and given where the NDP is going, in order to be able to attack the progressive side of the Trudeau agenda, uh, you might see it uh, uh, raise its prominence through the course of the election campaign. What about attitudes towards politics and politicians generally? All the parties have variations on the theme of we're in this for the people, which seems to be a deliberate sort of anti-elite message. Why is that? What is it that they're tapping into? Well, it's, it's a, a phenomena that we see worldwide uh, in which there's a whole group of the population that believes that the economy is rigged, it's working on behalf of a very exclusive group of the population, that decisions get made and the public really doesn't understand why they're being made or why they're in their interest, and they've decided to okay. couch it in these terms of the people versus everybody Let's else. All right, Daryl Bricker from Ipsos, uh, thanks so much. We're going to come back to you as we wait for the Prime Minister to emerge from Rideau Hall. Let's go to Mercedes Stevenson, who is outside waiting for the Prime Minister. Mercedes, you're going to be heading off uh, almost immediately on uh, the 40-day campaign with the Liberal Party, with uh, Justin Trudeau. This will be a different campaign for him than it was uh, back in 2015. There's no talk of sunny ways this time. Uh, this really is his election to lose, isn't it? It is. And you know what? It would be historic, Donna, if he lost it, because typically Canadians give governments after one majority mandate another turn. It may not be another majority, but it's usually a minority. And in fact, only twice before in Canadian history has there been a situation where someone lost after a majority and getting that for the first time. 1878 and 1935. So certainly the pressure's on there for Justin Trudeau, but he also has the advantage that Canadians recognize his name. They they recognize his brand. He doesn't have to come from behind. Now, the downside of all that is he has to run against his own record. Broken promises on things, for example, like electoral reform. The SNC-Lavalin scandal, which was so counter to that Sunny Ways brand and the promise of transparency. And today, with that Globe and Mail story alleging again that there's obstruction, that there's not transparency in the government, that they're not releasing documents. Um, and there's people who voted for Justin Trudeau, and we know this because they've told it to pollsters, and we've heard it anecdotally saying they thought he was different. So they may not vote for him this time because they believe he's different, but will they be willing to give someone else a chance? That's always a higher risk in a voter's mind, particularly when they don't feel they know the other candidates as well. So an advantage in being an incumbent because he's no longer coming from behind, but also the disadvantage that you can't promise you're something radically different than the status quo. And it's always easier to poke holes than it is to build up. So I think how you're going to see Justin Trudeau framing this is not give me another chance or give me a chance. It will be let me finish what I started. Let me continue the things that you chose the first time. Let me have a chance to implement them. And this really being framed as an election that is about choice. They will see the conservatives and try to position them as going backward and going to Stephen Harper. They will try to contrast that against the premiers in the provinces like Jason Kenney or Doug Ford, particularly in Ontario. They will try to play against Ford's numbers here. He's not been 
popular and they will say, do you want that federally? So that's the advantages and disadvantages that Justin Trudeau has coming in. But he's a very strong campaigner because, Donna, remember, in 2015, no one expected him to win and he delivered a significant majority. Yeah, it certainly came from behind back then. And Mercedes, we're just waiting for the prime minister. We've got a one minute warning, so we expect to see him shortly and hear from him. Just quickly, um, where where the leaders go uh, is indicative of where they think they have the strongest chances and can make gains. Where is he going uh, today? We're headed out to you, Donna. We're Yay. going to be in Vancouver tonight. I'll be on that plane. Uh, there is a big campaign rally planned with a former television anchor who's running out there, a high-profile female candidate. Uh, and certainly Vancouver is going to rank really high for the NDP, the Greens, and the Liberals in this campaign. It is one that they need to take, any of them, if they want to do well. So I think you're going to see uh, all of those three parties spending significant time out there, starting with Mr. Trudeau this evening. And so British Columbia will be a battleground. What's the other big battlegrounds we should be looking out for? So the other big battlegrounds you want to look out for are Quebec, uh, where we know from the most recent polling this morning that the Liberals are significantly ahead, but the Conservatives have really been pushing their ground game there, trying to gain. The NDP needs to, at a minimum, maintain something they've been struggling to do, hopefully convince more seats from their perspective to be able to do half decently. So that's going to be a major battleground, whether it's Montreal or especially up around Quebec City and in northern Quebec. There's some ridings in play there that could be three- and four-way splits. The other area is the GTA, as we call it, the Greater Toronto Area, or the 905, which is the area code there. There's a lot of swing ridings there and undecided voters and ridings that flip back and forth between the Conservatives and the Liberals. They'll be driving very hard in that area, and that, of course, is where Jagmeet Singh is launching from today. He's in London, Ontario. But this will be a really unique election in terms of seeing elections, uh, particular ridings, where there's three- and four-way splits between the parties. We've usually seen a three-party system, in many cases, most too. Uh, but those splits that could hive off just a little bit of the vote could flip ridings in unexpected directions because of the way that our political system works in Canada. Um, and it's interesting, you know, you, you talked about where the party leaders are going. The Conservative Party, uh, Andrew Scheer, is in the air, uh, along with our Abigail Beeman and the rest of the reporters, en route to Trois-Rivières, Quebec. And we've been told that their plane was rerouted to Quebec City um, because of fog. Don't usually expect weather to be a factor in a campaign that's <laughs> happening in September, you know? I mean, really, the winter, snow is a, can be a devil. Uh, but... Um, Fog has uh, already uh, derailed plans for the first day of campaigning for Andrew Scheer. That can't, that can't be a can't be a happy day for those uh, campaign that campaign oh, team. You you wonder, you know, the, the whole thing, is it an omen? They'll say no, uh, but no campaign wants to start off with a bump like this, especially when they wanted to pursue the SNC-Lavalin. It's not their fault. They've not done something wrong. It's fog. Uh, but Campaigns are funny things. The littlest bump, the littlest change can affect people's perception. They're highly unpredictable, and that's why we go into it saying, well, here are the polling numbers, and Daryl certainly can speak to this, but you don't know what the outcome is going to be because of those unexpected things. You remember the conservative campaign bus that broke down a couple of elections ago, and it became seen as a symbol for the conservative campaign. So nobody wants that. They're going to have to try to turn it around. Obviously, it's a minor thing, but it's fascinating in politics how minor things uh, that, that aren't even even mistakes the campaign has made can be delivered and that people here we are talking about the fact that they can't land because of the fog. Yeah, they're unpredictable things. And you know, uh, credit to everyone who gets involved in political campaigns in this country. The amount of work and the amount of miles uh, that have to be covered in this massive country of ours, uh, which is, you know, uh, we all love and fantastic, but to run a federal campaign takes a lot of energy, a lot of money, and uh, can be exhausting. So I just want to pay tribute to all of the campaign teams and the volunteers <laughs> out there who are, you know, making this thing happen. We just got um, a two-minute warning that the Prime Minister will be coming out of Rideau Hall. We got a one-minute warning about three minutes ago, so I don't know. Do the math. Anyway, he's late. So <laughs> not not for the first time. Um, uh, he has a bit of a reputation not, not for common. not showing up at events on time. Um, Mercedes, what do you think is his greatest vulnerability going into this campaign? Everyone's talking about SNC. I, I am not completely convinced that 
Canadians across this country had as much time to pay attention to get into the weeds of that issue as as you and I did and people who cover politics all the time. Do you think that um, that is his biggest weakness right now? Well, you know, it'll be interesting to see because the question is what's happening with the police. Uh, it didn't affect him when the ethics report came out, even though it was a pretty damning report. It didn't move the numbers in the polls because it seemed like people who'd made their minds up had already made their minds up. They polarized on it one way or the other, so they didn't take additional damage, although it did damage them back in the spring when this was all blowing up in the news. So that could be an issue if we start talking police investigation because that's a whole other level, but we'd have to see how it plays out. I I think the bigger issue are some of the promises that he made that he wasn't able to keep and that contrast between what he actually promised and what he's able to deliver. Mm -hmm. Like the bloom is off the rose. I think we're um, just seeing uh, the Prime Minister and Sophie Gregoire Trudeau. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, is walking up to the podium and will um, talk about his campaign and set the tone for the next 40 days. Let's listen. I want to begin by recalling the victims of 9-11. 18 years ago this morning, thousands of people were murdered in brutal acts of terror in the United States, including many Canadians. Today, as we prepare to exercise our democratic rights, we recognize and honour their lives. May their memories be a blessing to us all. Merci d'être ici avec nous ce matin so à Rideau Hall. Il y a morning, quelques instants, j'ai rencontré son Excellence, le Gouverneur Général, qui a accédé à ma demande de dissoudre le Parlement. Les se rendront aux urnes le 21 octobre prochain. Dans élection, as Canadians, we get to make an important choice about the future of our country. We get to decide what kind of future we want to build together. In 2015, after a decade of failed conservative policy, Canada's economy was flat. Economic growth, job creation, wage growth, all were stalled, thanks to a conservative government that believed cuts and austerity were the answers to everything. Les Canadiens ont choisi une nouvelle équipe qui était prête à investir dans les gens et dans leur communauté. Une équipe in qui a compris que même si on vit dans le meilleur pays du monde, il est toujours possible world, de faire mieux. Possible to et bien qu'il nous reste encore énormément de well, travail à faire, tell you that we have a lot on a passé les quatre do. dernières années We've spent à the past améliorer four les years choses improving et on a le bilan pour le prouver. And we have the la track record to prove it. Poverty has dropped. Parmi the unemployment rate is one of the lowest in record in history. Et tout ça, parce que notre and équipe all that is because our team moved away from cuts and austerity that we saw during the Harper years. And in instead, we decided to invest in the middle class and people who are We've working hard to get there. Money in people's pockets by cutting taxes for the middle class and raising them on the wealthiest 1%. We stopped sending child benefit checks to millionaires so we could send more to the single parent working two jobs and to the family of five that falls a bit short at the end of each month. We made the Canada Pension Plan stronger because in a country like ours, seniors shouldn't struggle to make ends meet. We renegotiated NAFTA securing trade access to our largest and most important trading partner at a time of U.S. protectionism and unpredictability. And we're conserving more of our nature and ensuring that our air stays clean and our water stays safe because we owe it to our kids and to ourselves to take care of our environment. These are things that are making a real difference in people's lives. And this fall, Canadians once again get to vote for the kind of Canada they want to live in. We've all got a choice to make. Keep moving forward and build on the progress we've made, or go back to the politics of the Harper years. Conservatives like to say they're for the people, but then they cut taxes for the wealthy and cut services for everybody else. Mais comme les Canadiens le savent, 
But as Canadians know full well, this is not the right way to approach matters. We are not going to get richer by cutting. And this is why our government has decided to make progress our priority. We are investing in families, workers and communities. We chose to have confidence in Canadians. And over the past four years, more than one million new jobs have been created. We negotiated new agreements on health with provinces and the territories. We introduced the new family allocation, which is helping parents with hundreds of dollars per year free of tax. We came up, we brought out 900,000 Canadians out of poverty. And under a Liberal government, Canada will continue At to make progress. At the end of the progress. day, politics is about people. Maybe you're a recent grad or a new Canadian. Maybe you're raising your kids or living out your golden years in retirement. Whoever you are, you deserve a real plan for your future. We've done a lot together these past four years, but the truth is, we're just getting started. So Canadians have an important choice to make. Will we go back to the failed policies of the past, or will we continue to move forward? That's the choice. It's that clear, and it's that important. I'm for moving forward for everyone. Merci. Good morning. Michelle Zilio with the Globe and Mail. Prime Minister, what is your government trying to hide by refusing to waive cabinet confidentiality so the RCMP can properly investigate the role your office plays in the SNC Lavalin case? We uh, gave out uh, the largest and most expansive waiver of cabinet confidence in Canada's history. Nous avons suspendu le secret du cabinet de façon waived cabinet secrecy in a fashion that's never been done before in Canadian history. So are you going to ask the Privy Council clerk to waive cabinet confidentiality? We respect the decisions made by our professional public servants. We respect the decision made by the clerk. So we respect the decisions made by the public service and we respect the, serv the decision of the Privy Council. Um, Clerk. I'm curious as to, you come here today uh, having four years after you took power saying conservatives are not our enemies, they're our friends and neighbours, and yet your party is uh, fiercely attacking uh, the Conservatives demonizing them. I'm wondering how do you, what do you say to your children when you speak about Andrew Scheer? As I've said many, many times, uh, I do not engage in personal attacks, but I will be very, very sharp on distinctions around policy, on uh, how one engages with Canadians and the vision one puts forward. Uh, that is something that Canadians uh, deserve in an election, to see clear contrasts between a vision uh, that is open, inclusive, and respectful of everyone's rights, uh, and a perspective that says they're for the people, but then delivers cuts to services and cuts to taxes for the wealthy. Uh, and just a follow. Okay. Uh, je serai toujours très clair. So I'm always going to be quite clear. I'm not going to make any personal attacks. However, I will be very sharp when it comes to policy differences. Our visions for the country are quite different. The liberal approach is positive and inclusive, and the conservative approach, quite frankly, is what is designed and based on austerity and giving tax cuts to the wealthy. So we're going to be very clear with Canadians the choice they're faced with. To follow up on SNC-Lavalin, you have said you take responsibility, yet you disagreed with the ethics find report findings. You've got a McClellan report, but in all of this time. I don't think Canadians have heard you explain what you feel you personally did wrong. What were your mistakes in that affair? Could you explain to us what you feel you, where you went wrong? My job as Prime Minister is to be there to stand up for and defend Canadians' jobs, whether it's communities right across the country or pensioners or families. Uh, I will always defend the public interest. I will always defend people's jobs. Uh, I've been unequivocal about that from the very beginning, and that's what I will continue to do. No mistakes. 
No mistakes. Good morning, Teresa Wright, the Canadian Press. Uh, you've triggered an election today and you're asking Canadians to vote for you. Perhaps you could tell Canadians why uh, they should trust you to be returned to power when we still don't know all the details of the SNC-Lavalin affair, uh, despite numerous attempts, and, uh, and some of that has to do with uh, committees with a Liberal majority blocking those details going forward. We made a commitment to Canadians to grow the economy for the middle class and for people working hard to join it. That was the heart of the promise we got elected on. And we have delivered on that by uh, watching Canadians create well over a million jobs over the past four years at the same time as 900,000 Canadians have been lifted out of poverty. Our commitment to invest in communities, our commitment to support and move forward on giving a real chance to Indigenous peoples to succeed by advancing reconciliation, to move forward on demonstrating that we understand that growing the economy and protecting the environment goes together every step of the way, and it's not a choice of either or anymore. These are the things that we committed to Canadians to do, and this is exactly what we've done over the past four years. We are the first to recognize there's an awful lot more to do, and I'm very much looking forward to getting out and talking with Canadians from coast to coast to coast over the coming weeks about our plans to continue building a better Canada as we all move forward. Today is the 18th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. What would you say to those who might uh, say that it, it could be seen as insensitive to be calling an election uh, on this particular tragic anniversary? As I said in my words in the beginning, the uh, exercise of our fundamental democratic rights, uh, the moment to engage in reflecting on how we move forward with a better future for everyone, uh, is uh, a deeply held value with which uh, we celebrate uh, the successes and the tragedies of the past. Uh, we remember uh, all the families, uh, all the individuals lost and the families affected by the terrible, terrible attacks of September 11, 2001. Uh, and uh, we move forward in pledging ourselves every day to a better, safer, uh, more prosperous society for everyone. And that's what this election is all about. Mr. Trudeau, you were quite clear in terms of the secularism law in Quebec. You don't really like the law, you think it's an error. So if you come back to power, will your government actually go to court against that particular piece of legislation? Well, yes, in fact, I do not agree with Bill 21. I think in a free society, we should avoid legitimizing or allowing discrimination against anybody. I'm quite happy that Quebecers themselves are doing the protesting. They are actually taking the, liberal, the, the CAQ government to court. That would be our approach as well. We're looking closely at the matter. We'll see how things unfold. But for right now, we think it would be counterproductive for the federal government to get directly involved. As I've said many times, I am uh, deeply opposed uh, to Bill 21 in Quebec. I don't think that in a free society we should be legitimizing or allowing discrimination against anyone. I'm very pleased that Quebecers themselves have choose, chosen uh, to contest uh, this bill in court, to stand up and defend the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, we have been, I have been uh, watching very closely the process and considering uh, the federal potential actions and at this time I feel it would be counterproductive for the federal government to engage in this process. Okay, counterproductive, but is that a definitive decision on your part? Will you, are you saying you will stay out of it indefinitely? Well, like I said, we're watching closely, and for the time being, we don't find it will be productive to get involved. But we will continue to watch things closely, and we'll take decisions in a timely fashion. As I said, we are following very carefully the process. At this time, we feel it would be counterproductive for the federal government to engage uh, in the process with which Quebecers are underway. But we will continue to monitor closely and uh, evaluate our position. Good morning, Zian Lem with HuffPost Canada. Millennials make up the largest block of eligible voters in this election. 
How do you plan to try to regain young people's trust, specifically those who might be disappointed you promised to be different and you turned out to be just like every other politician? I think uh, Canadians uh, of all ages, particularly millennials, have seen the transformation of our country over the past four years as we've uh, both uh, created economic growth and lifted people out of poverty, as we've moved forward on uh, the most ambitious uh, leadership ever seen by a Canadian government on protecting the environment at the same time as we continue to prepare for future prosperity for families right across the country. These are the things that uh, young Canadians expect, indeed that all Canadians expect. And I very much look forward to the coming weeks where we will be uh, rolling out uh, a very ambitious platform designed to, to uh, help Canadians look towards the future with even more confidence uh, than they already have in this extraordinary country. Bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Uh, Pourriez-vous élaborer, yes, expliquer good morning. un petit Could peu ce que vous estimez de contre-productif à l'idée de, de vous impliquer dans la contestation de la loi 21 au Québec en ce moment? Et vous dites que vous allez continuer de surveiller le, le dossier au fur et à mesure. Qu'est-ce que vous surveillez qui pourrait vous faire changer d'idée dans ce débat? Mais qu'est-ce qui pourrait vous faire changer d'idée dans ce débat? Mais qu'est-ce qui pourrait vous faire changer d'idée dans ce débat? Mais qu'est-ce qui pourrait vous faire changer in a free and open society, we should not be working against fundamental rights and freedoms. We can't legitimize discrimination against citizens based on religion or anything else for that matter. So that's why we're concerned by Bill 21. And like I said earlier, Quebecers themselves have already decided to contest this in court. They are defending the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so as a Quebecer myself, and also as part of the Liberal government, we are watching the process closely, and we are taking a look at whether or not we need to intervene or not. That's the state of my decision-making process right now. It may change over time, but right now there's a legal process underway. All right, fine, but the question is, you're the PM of Canada. Are you going to push it right to the end? I'm trying to understand your overall thinking. At one point, would you get involved? It doesn't seem quite clear. So, anyway, we can get to that later, but let me move into climate change. You seem to be drawing a very clear contrast between yourselves and the Conservatives, the Bloc, the NDP and so on. How do you think that message is going to get across in terms of the environment? Well, look, Canadians understand full well that climate change is a real threat, not just to our communities, not just to the planet, but also to our economy. And so that's why we have a very clear plan which is already acting in terms of protecting the environment. We've done more on the environment than any other government in the history of our country, but at the same time, we're helping youth families and workers to retool and reskill themselves for the new jobs that will be available in a much more green and clean environment and economy. So we're working hard to protect the environment and to boost the economy. We've already shown this over the past four years and we will do so in the future. It's really too bad that the Conservatives still don't understand that climate change is a real threat. And they are going to have to deal with it eventually. Once again, we're seeing conservative politicians across this country spending public money to deny climate change. They're not investing, they're actually saying, look, the climate crisis is not such a big deal. We, in contrast, are going to show through our actions and our commitments that Canadians expect leadership, concrete leadership from the federal government in terms of climate change. That's the only way we can protect future generations and to retool our economy for the future. So what does that mean? Well, we are going to very closely follow, just to get back to the previous question about Bill 21, as I said earlier, we're following it closely. It would be counterproductive to intervene right now. I'm from the Canadian press on the same issue. You said for now you're not going to intervene. So what does that mean? 
Will that, have a, will that depend on whether you're a minority or majority government? Look, it doesn't matter. We will always be working hard to defend the rights of all Canadians, whether it be in Quebec or elsewhere. People really enormously appreciate the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Many Quebecers among those. We live in a free and open society, and a lot of Quebecers are thinking we shouldn't be legitimizing discrimination against anybody. What do you say to people who say, well, you actually are compromising the values of diversity and inclusion and so on? It seems to me I've always been quite clear on that. I don't think there's one Quebecer who is unaware of the fact that I'm against Bill 21. They know where I stand. My responsibility as the Prime Minister is to ensure that, that we defend the rights of all Canadians. And so that's why I'm very pleased to see that Quebecers themselves are actually taking the government to court. Prime Minister, you're starting your uh, tour in Vancouver. Is it because it's right next door to your former Justice Minister, now rival Jody Wilson-Raybould? In 2015, um, we uh, launched our uh, election campaign uh, by attending uh, the Pride Parade in Vancouver uh, and launched it right across the country. And you may remember that uh, there were many folks uh, assembled here today and in the press gallery across the, uh, the city uh, who decry that it was a terrible mistake to not uh, be here in Ottawa for the election launch by the Liberal campaign. Uh, we demonstrated that uh, campaigns happen out there across Canada and launching the campaign in my second home of British Columbia uh, felt right both in 2015 and it feels right uh, right now in 2019. I can't wait to get out to BC to this afternoon, uh, but I'm very much looking forward to getting right across the country uh, in the coming weeks. There are a lot of Canadians to talk to about the important choice they're facing about whether we move forward or we go back to the Harper years. Uh, I know that Canadians are excited uh, about the opportunities ahead of us, uh, and I am excited uh, to roll up my sleeves and keep working for them every single day. Uh, in 2015, so in 2015, we chose to launch our campaign in Vancouver, despite the fact that many individuals said that was a big error on our part that we should have been in Ottawa to launch. But we showed that an election campaign is a cross-country affair, not just Ottawa-centric. And so that's why I'm very pleased to be going to Vancouver today. That's my second home, actually, in BC. And I'm going to launch my campaign there. And in the upcoming weeks, I'm going to be crisscrossing this country to make sure I have all the most important conversations that can be had with Canadians with respect to choice for the future. Are we going to continue to move forward? Are we going to go back to the Harper years. Uh, your opponents keep attacking you on questions of ethics. How would you respond to their critique that uh, you are inauthentic going into this campaign? I think Canadians know very well uh, that I am focused on making the right choices for Canadians and moving forward in a way that benefits the middle class, people working hard to join it, that moves forward on reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, that demonstrates the only way to build a strong economy moving forward is to protect the environment at the same time. We are all in for building a better future for Canadians, and that's why we choose forward. Merci tout le monde. Whole bunch of great Canadians. All right, there is uh, Justin Trudeau shaking the hands of what well, we understand some volunteers uh, from the, the campaign who are there uh, on the grounds of Rideau Hall. Sophie Gregoire Trudeau there with him, uh, about to embark on uh, his second federal campaign across the country. As he said, he's heading to Vancouver um, almost immediately, and our Mercedes Stevenson will be hopping on that plane to join him. Mercedes, what did you make? of this kickoff um, to his campaign. Uh, he was asked some pretty point-blank questions about uh, the controversies that he's had to deal with, um, self-inflicted wounds um, in his own government. Uh, what did you make of his answers, particularly to the SNC affair and uh, whether why he didn't waive uh, cabinet confidentiality? 
Well, some very tough questions there, Donna, and frankly, he didn't answer them. He stuck to his talking points when he was asked why he had not uh, waived cabinet confidence so that the RCMP could talk to people. He didn't deny that the RCMP were trying to talk to people, which I thought was very interesting. He didn't say, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm unaware of it. Uh, instead, he said, look, we've given the broadest waiver of cabinet confidence in history. I don't know if that's true, by the way. We do know that past governments have waived cabinet confidence when their investigations include including uh, in the sponsorship scandal and Prime Minister Harper did so during uh, the, the Duffy scandal and there was an actual court case that came out of that and criminal charges. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on him to explain why he won't waive it. He says he respects the decision of the bureaucrats who have made this. Well, at the end of the day, it is in fact up to him as a politician, as the Prime Minister, to make that decision about whether he wanted to waive cabinet confidence in this case. I don't think the answers were particularly convincing because this is someone who's saying he is all about trans transparency, and yet he is unwilling to give that kind of access that the police have allegedly been asking for. And again, I think it's really interesting that he didn't deny uh, that, that there had been questions asked there. That is going to dog him uh, right off the top. Also, you heard a lot about that secularism bill in Quebec. This is a party that has been out there talking about diversity, trumpeting themselves on that, saying how important it is and how they are the party that really supports Canadians of all backgrounds and the discrimination is wrong. And he he says that, but then he also kind of contradicts himself by saying at this point he thinks it would not help for the federal government to get involved. He would not help for there to be an actual uh, federal court case. But he doesn't explain why that is. So those are contradictions to his brand. They're contradictions to his promises. And I don't think the answers were convincing. So we'll see if they come up with something better as the campaign goes on. But I think you just got a taste there of him trying to stick to his answers, trying to avoid wading into controversy and reporters not letting him off the hook. Well, and the question directly, what did you do wrong? Or, you know, did you make any mistakes? He didn't even allude to a single mistake, which um, is interesting because we all make mistakes, right? But I guess first day of your campaign is not the moment to start admitting to any of them. No, and especially if you say you take personal responsibility for what happened. Well, then, if you take responsibility, what are you taking responsibility for? And I've talked to experts who say part of the reason why he doesn't want to apologize is because it actually puts him at legal risk if he does so, because you have to be specific for what you apologized for. But in this particular case, you know, he He's gone from saying he did nothing wrong to he regretted things to there were mistakes made. Okay, but now we won't talk about the mistakes. People look at that and they look for authenticity and they look for ownership. Uh, and if he doesn't own that, it keeps coming up. On the other hand, if he does own it, he hands something to his opponents for them to attack him on. Uh, but the fact that he wouldn't even go there, that he was so overtly not addressing the questions that he was being asked, uh, I think you're just going to continue to see those questions being asked again and again. Of course, the Liberals are hoping that the campaign's attention will shift to something else, but they certainly didn't want to touch any of that with a 10-foot pole on their first day. Yep, that's for sure. Um, Mercedes, help us understand a little bit about the dynamics in Quebec, this fence-sitting answer that the Prime Minister gave about Bill uh, 21, saying, you know, he doesn't like it, doesn't agree with it, but on the other hand, it's counterproductive to try and engage in it in any way right now. Uh, he wants to have it both ways, I guess, in Quebec. And, and you know that that talking out of both sides of your mouth might have worked in the past where things were more localized, but now we're talking national. Everything's everywhere within minutes. Uh, and even in our broadcast, right? We're broadcasting all across Canada. There's people in Quebec watching this. There's people in BC watching this, listening on the radio, online. And he's saying publicly that they are the party of diversity, that you should not trust the Conservatives because they don't support that. There's questions about that. They hearken back uh, to the so-called snitch line from the 2015 campaign on barbaric cultural practices that the Conservatives put out, which was very damaging to them, the whole niqab debate. The Liberals have always been on the other side of that. And yet here you have a situation where this bill, for those who are unfamiliar at home, bans people from working in the public sector if they are wearing overtly religious symbols, like a hijab or a kippah. Um, and that really is very strong part of some people's identity. And now in this case, you're having them say that they can't do that anymore. So how do you come out and say you're the party of diversity, but refuse to officially challenge this bill? He's trying to divert it and give it in instead to the people of Quebec and saying they're challenging it. Okay, but where's his principle as the, you know, leader, le, le, the leader of the party that says uh, they're the most aggressive on this? And I think that could be problematic for him in Quebec, but they're worried that if they attack this bill, they will lose popularity in Quebec and they need to win there. So this is about seats, not principles. 
All right, Mercedes Stevenson, we're going to come back to you outside Rideau Hall there. If we can, if you if you have to leave to get on the plane, we completely understand. But for now, we're going to head <laughs> so over. So far, so good. I'll okay. let you know. Okay, great. We're going to head over to uh, the NDP uh, leader, Jagmeet Singh, uh, who is in London, Ontario. He's just about to launch uh, his campaign. Let's listen. Friends, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Atawandaran, and the Wendat peoples. 18 years ago, a terrorist attack hit the United States and shocked the world. Canadians reached out with compassion and care. And I want to just take a moment to acknowledge those who lost their life, and the friends and family that continue to be impacted by that loss, and the first responders who responded so courageously. Friends, we're here in London, beautiful city, a uh, city I spent five years of my life when I went to Western. I got to say it was a city where I spent some of my, I had some of my best memories and some of my toughest. This is the city where my brother uh, came to live with me. I took him in and I took care of him. It's a time when we went through a lot of struggles. I had to work a lot of jobs to make ends meet. And it was during that time that a lot of friends and family stepped up and helped me out. They helped out with food and with support. And it reminded me of a very Canadian value. I wouldn't have got through those tough times without their support. And that's what Canadians believe in. We believe in taking care of one another. Now, you all know I love Canada. And I believe we can make it even better. Earlier today, I had a chance to speak with Jessica, Nancy, and Jack. Now, Jessica is pregnant and a cancer survivor. And she told me about how difficult it was and how difficult it is for her to afford the medication that she needs without the coverage. It's crushing. I met Nancy and Jack, who are both retired, and they told me about how they continue to worry about out-of-pocket healthcare expenses. They don't know when the next expense is going to come up. They don't know how much, how much it's going to cost for dental care or if they need new glasses, and they're worried. Now, I believe we can do better for people like Nancy, Jack, and Jessica. But we can do that only if we have the courage to take on the powerful interests at the very top. We can expand our Medicare system to include medication for all, pharmacare for all, and extend it beyond that to include dental care, vision and hearing care, and mental health services. We can do that, but only if we have the courage to take on the lobbyists and the corporate interests. We can build 500,000 new affordable homes across this country and tackle the housing crisis. We can do that, but only if we have the courage to take on money launderers and speculators that keep on driving the cost of housing. And we can provide a relief for Canadians who are paying some of the highest costs in the world for cell phones and internet services. We can do that but only if we have the courage to take on the big telecom lobbyists. And we can fight now. We can act now to take on the climate crisis and build 300,000 new quality jobs, but only if we have the courage to take on the big polluters and to end the fossil fuel subsidies. Nous vivons dans un pays, nous vivons dans we un pays live où les riches sont de plus en plus in a country where the rich keep getting richer, de la population where the majority of the population doesn't have pays, access to the same advantages, where both conservative and liberal governments have rigged a system in favor of the rich Four and leaving ago, everybody else Justin behind. Trudeau charmed us with pretty words and empty promises. He said the right things, but he didn't do them. Behind closed doors, Justin Trudeau does whatever the wealthy and powerful corporations want him to do. It's clear Justin Trudeau isn't who he pretended to be. 
and Andrew Scheer and the conservatives are not the answer. <laughs> they are going to cut taxes for the wealthy, but they're going to cut services that you and your families count on. You'll pay the price with an even worse, with even more expensive health care, an even more expensive medication, and an even worsening climate crisis. Mes amis, à chaque élection, les libéraux et les so, dear friends, each election, the liberals and the conservatives make a whole series of promises, but too often they don't follow through. So when it comes time to choose between the interests of Canadians in general or major multinationals, their choice is quite clear. They choose the big oil companies and the big pharmaceutical companies. When you want different results, then you have to make different choices. So in this election, it's a very clear choice, isn't it? Who can you count on to fight for you? So this election comes down to a really clear question. Who can you count on to fight for you? When I was a kid, <laughs> that's right. When I was a kid, I never imagined that someone that looked like me would be running to be prime minister. People told me time and time again the things that I couldn't do. But now, kids run up and say, Seeing you do this, I feel like I can do anything. And that's inspirational. <laughs> we have an exciting opportunity over the next 40 days. We are going to bring a hopeful message to Canadians that we can build the country of our dreams. A country where everyone has a place to call home. Healthcare when they need it. Clean water to drink and clean air to breathe. Good jobs and a bright future. You know, everywhere I go, I meet hardworking people who want to be treated fairly and want to build a good life for themselves and their family. These are the people New Democrats have always worked for. These are the people I'm in it for. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to take any of your questions. I have a question. We'll start, we'll start right Sorry, here. Um, uh, CTV News over here, Kevin Gallagher. So, Mr. Singh. Um, launching your campaign, the polling numbers that we see, of course, are lower than those when Tom Mulcair was voted out of the, the party. Pundits are saying the party's in trouble, uh, you know, that you're going to have a very difficult time holding on to what you have in the House of Commons. What's your strategy giving that context? Well, you know, we're looking at what's, uh, what's going on right now in Canada. And what I'm hearing from people is that they're done with governments that seem to continually prioritize making it easier for the very rich and making it harder for them. They want someone who's going to stand up and expand our healthcare system. The questions that I keep on hearing about how hard it is to pay for medication really plague me. And, and I think about the fact that we are in this position because governments have chosen to make it easier for big pharma instead of making it easier for people. And I'm confident that people will see in us champions who want to put them at the center and the heart of everything we do. On that subject of affordability, of yep. course, we're in London, Ontario, home of General Dynamics, the contract uh, that has the labs going to Saudi Arabia, a contract that you would cancel if you're prime minister. What would you say to workers here that depend on those types of contracts for their livelihoods? I'd say to those workers that Canada has a lot of needs in our own military services, that there's a lot of need that we could satisfy, a lot of contracts we could satisfy here in Canada. And those hardworking people should continue to have those contracts here in Canada or in jurisdictions where there's not uh, an oppressive regime like in Saudi Arabia. If there's any example of a time when we should be cancelling an arms deal, it's in the example where we've got a country that's alleged to have committed murder of a journalist, that's involved in an ongoing killing of the people of Yemen, and that has been implicated in horrible human rights violations of its own citizens. This is a case that calls out for ending that agreement 
but continuing with contracts here in Canada so that we continue to maintain those jobs. Je m'excuse, c'était pendant l'applaudissement. Sorry, je I didn't hear your your name because people were applauding. Oui, bonjour. I'm from Radio uh, Canada. Okay, good morning. So the RCMP seems to be having difficulty interviewing people on the SCN Lavalin corruption scandal. If it were possible to interview those people, do you think we would learn anything new? Of course we would. Because what we have already learned is that, yes, people have have things to share, ministers have information to share, but they don't have a right to tell their story because of cabinet secrecy. And so the RCMP and the Ethics Commissioner are unable to get this information. So the Ethics Commissioner said, look, he was approached by ministers who wanted to share their story, but unfortunately they can't because of the cabinet secrecy rule. Okay, so you want to be the champ, if you will, for your average person, so does Trudeau, so does the Conservative Party. So I'm wondering what really makes you different from others? Why should people vote for you? Because you're unlikely to form a government. Well, look, we're going to have a national campaign. We're going to be traveling all across Canada. But that's a very good question. Yes, the Conservatives say they're for your average person. But what do they do when they get in power? They start cutting services and they cut taxes for the rich. They cut health and health services, they cut a whole range of services that people need. So that's quite clear in terms of a choice. Now, if we take a look at what's happened in the past, it's always a struggle between the people and the big companies. And what do the Liberals and Conservatives do? They promote the interests of the major corporations. So, who is going to be there fighting for you? And I'm saying, well, it's the NDP. We've always done so, and we will continue to do so. Hi, Mr. Singh. Hannah Thibodeau with CBC National Hi there. News. Uh, I just want to ask you, following up to Kevin's question, you say that, you know, we're talking about problems with the campaign already as we head in. What do you personally have to do to move forward and get over a lot of these hurdles? Well, we're, we're showing people right now with our commitments. We're committed to changing the way things are done in, in politics. We want to do things differently, and I believe it can be done. We've seen the past number of years, the record has been that governments in Ottawa really haven't responded to the needs of people. I'll give you one concrete example. When it comes to the cost of medication, something that is plaguing Canadians, something that people are worried about, when we look at the commitments made by Mr. Trudeau, he promised to reduce the cost of medication by a simple change that would have just set a list of different countries to compare our prices to. He abandoned that commitment, and we wonder why. Well, in four years, he met with the pharmaceutical lobbyist over 875 times, uh, the, the, the great uh, corporate interest lobbyist. And as a result of that, he abandoned a commitment. That's a choice. That's not a, a happenstance or a coincidence. What we're saying to Canadians is this. We are committed to fighting the powerful interests and making sure people's needs are put first. And that's what we bring. But I don't think that answered the question about you personally and the hurdles you personally have to overcome in this campaign. Okay, sure. Um, you know, sure, I face hurdles in my life historically, and I've, I face hurdles maybe now. Uh, but it's no different for many people in Canada who face uh, hurdles and barriers because of their own identity. Uh, women continue to face barriers in advancements in their careers. They're underrepresented in almost every sector when you look at those at the higher echelon, whether it's in the corporate culture, whether it's in academia, women are underrepresented. People are faced with barriers because of their sexuality, because of the language they speak, because of their identity, their religion. Uh, those are challenges that many Canadians face. And I can say that maybe I experience a little bit of what people go through, and I hope people can see in me someone that understands those realities and wants to build a country where there are no barriers, where no one has to face these barriers based on who they are. They can be celebrated who, for who they are and they can achieve the best that they can in their lives.
Alex Ballingall with the Toronto Star. Um, the bulkier platform's been out for now a few months, um, and there's some pretty big, likely expensive promises in it. Um, when will Canadians see a full costing of the NDP's platform so they can judge whether what you're promising is feasible or possible? Well, I, in terms of feasibility, it's really a matter of choices. I mean, if you look at the past year, Mr. Trudeau didn't do a feasibility study before he cut the corporate tax rate by uh, $14 billion to allow the wealthiest corporations to buy corporate jets and limousines. He didn't study that. He made a choice. He didn't really ask people or consult whether Canada could afford to buy a pipeline, and he spent $4.5 billion on a pipeline. That's almost $20 billion in money that was spent to help out the wealthiest, not to help out Canadians. We would make different choices. With the resources we have, we take it very seriously. We take our budget very seriously. But we would invest in things like universal pharmacare for all, building the housing that people need, making sure people are put at the center of what we do. We also have put forward some of our measures. So we're working with the Parliamentary Budget Office to put out the costing. And one of the things that we've done, announced recently is to pay for some of our promises, we're ready to increase revenue. And to do that, we're asking the people at the very top to pay a little more. And so we put forward a super wealth tax, which is a tax on those who've got fortunes of over 20 million. The PBO has announced that that would raise in the first year close to 6 billion, and eventually it could build up to about $10 billion. That's a commitment to raise funds to, to in, enact our promises. Um, as I'm sure you know, Pierre Nantel yesterday, a former uh, NDP MP, uh, basically was saying that uh, if there was a referendum, he would vote for Quebec separation. Um, it should happen as soon as possible. Um, I'm wondering what you think of that and what, if you have any concerns that somebody who obviously believes in, in splitting Canada apart felt at home in the NDP for so many years. Well, I mean, with New Democrats, uh, you know when you, what you get. We, we are a party that believes in working extremely hard to keep this beautiful country together. Um, but at the same time, we understand that Quebec is a unique nation, that it's a unique place, and it's, that's something that's very special. We celebrate that. Uh, what we will do as a New Democratic Party is make sure that everyone in our country, all the provinces, all the territories, all the nations, the First Nations, everyone feels that in Canada they will get justice, they will get fairness, they can build a good life. That's what we're committed to doing. Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm Colin Butler. I'm with the local CBC here in London. Um, you, you probably noticed it on your way in. London has a pretty visible problem. It has a huge problem with poverty, drugs. We hand out, the only city that hands out more needles than we do is Vancouver. So if you were to become prime minister, if your party were to gain power, even, even if it had a deciding vote in a minority parliament, how would it help clean up a problem that's extremely visible here where you know there's mental health and drug problems that no one seems to be able to solve uh, you touched on a problem that is really uh, rampant across canada but yes you see it here in london um, and there's a couple of reasons why we're faced with this problem one there's a massive gap when it comes to mental health services it's one of the elements of our healthcare that's really neglected in our healthcare system and so one of our responses to that is we believe that if someone needs mental health care, if they need addiction care, if they need rehab services, uh, they should be able to access that. And it shouldn't mean that only those who've got private insurance can get into a rehab facility. What I really believe is that if we develop a head-to-toe health care coverage, it should include massive investments in rehab and addiction services. It should also include supports for mental health services so that people can get the care they need. What we have now is a national crisis when it comes to uh, opioids and, and drug use. We need to respond to that crisis as a national crisis and as well with a healthcare response to help the people that are, that are dying, to help the people that need help and care, and we can do if we make better choices. But how do you make people care about that? I mean, there's people who have, they're in full-blown psychosis in the middle of the downtown and everybody ignores it. I mean, no one's, no one's talking about this in the race, so how do you make that a priority so that everybody's talking about it. Yeah, so what I've called for is, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is a, a national crisis. If there was uh, thousands of people dying as a result of Zika, we would have immediately mobilized the entire country with mobile centers to respond to that. Right now, there is a national crisis where thousands of Canadians are dying because of opioid use. 
It should be treated like a national crisis. I'm calling for that. On day one of a new democratic government, we would declare a public health emergency nationally, which would open up a lot of services and supports to provide care at the front level, at the front lines. Uh, in addition, we would say we should approach this in a different way. When people are dealing with addictions, these are folks that are dealing with mental health, they're dealing with addiction, they're dealing with poverty. The solution isn't to put them in jail. The solution is to provide them with care, with rehab, with addiction services, so that we can solve the problem and not just continually deal with the symptoms. We care about people, and we're going to respond in a way that shows how much we care and how much we can do when we work together. That is uh, federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. And uh, you are watching and listening to live coverage of the federal election campaign kickoff. We are going to go to this Quebec now, where the Bloc Québécois the are running. Of course, five parties running nationally, six parties in Quebec. And that party, sixth party in Quebec, is the Bloc Québécois. Yves-Francois Blanchette is the leader of the party. He took over that job a year ago, and he Je is speaking now. Let's listen. Who will be faithful to their values, not as a province, but as a nation, people, you will recognize as being like you, people who are for you. Who is going to speak on behalf of Quebecers? Who is going to promote Quebec's interests? Who is going to provide some sort of vision for Quebec moving forward? It's not a matter of attacking people. It's a matter of putting forth a project or a proposal, a vision. So for to Quebecers to be identified with th those whom they elect, they have to share values. One has to do with a profound attachment to French. Another has to do with equality between the sexes. And the third has to do with the right of women to control their own bodies. We would be responsible but generous when it comes to immigration. And what we've seen over the past few years, past few moments, I beg your pardon, we have seen there's already an attack on our values with respect to secularism. That's something that we inherited from the Quiet Revolution, and we are going to stick by it. We also want to make sure we protect our environment within Quebec and abroad. So, we need to stress the fact that there are a number of issues where Canada, over the past few years, has not exactly encouraged Quebec interests. One has to do with supply management. One has to do with how we encourage refugees. To we wanted to let you listen to a little bit of uh, the Bloc Québécois leader, Yves-François Blanchet. Uh, the Bloc holds uh, 10 seats in Quebec uh, in the last uh, government. Quebec, of course, unique in this country, the Bloc Québécois, unique party in this country, created, of course, back in 1991 uh, to separate from Canada. So um, interesting to see how they fare in this upcoming election. We also want to check in with the progressive conservative leader, Andrew Scheer. Uh, we mentioned that his plane was up in the air when uh, the writs were issued. He was on his way to uh, Trois-Rivières, Quebec. The plane had to get diverted because of fog and land in uh, Quebec City. Um, but we're going to play some remarks that he made before the plane took off, just so you get a sense of the tone of the progressive conservative campaign. Take a listen. Well, good morning, everyone. We are starting off this campaign today knowing two new things. One, that the RCMP is investigating into possible obstruction of justice charges in the Prime Minister's office. And two, that Justin Trudeau is doing everything he can to block that investigation. So I'm calling on Justin Trudeau to do the right thing and immediately waive full privilege so that those individuals can testify to the RCMP. Alors, Nous avons appris deux choses ce matin de ce début de la campagne. Un, le GRC fait enquête sur une possible entrave à la justice 
investigating into possible corruption. And the second is that the Liberal government needs to waive cabinet secrecy. Good morning, secrecy. Mr. Chair. My name is Katie Simpson, and I'm with CBC News. Um, does today's story in the Globe and Mail change at all your election campaign strategy? You know, we have been uh, telling Canadians and showing Canadians how Justin Trudeau has consistently misled them. He has lied. He has looked Canadians in the eyes and said things that he knew was not true. And we made the case that he has lost the moral authority to govern. So, over the next uh, five weeks or so, we're going to be outlining our vision for the country to put more money back in the pockets of Canadians and let them get ahead. But what today shows is that you just cannot trust Justin Trudeau. He will say anything to cover up his scandals and he'll say anything to get re-elected and Canadians cannot believe uh, the things that he says. Okay, so we saw after the ethics commissioner tabled his report, we saw Trudeau's support go down. What do you think will be different in this particular case? Well, this scandal is not a matter of impact on polls, it's a matter of integrity. Does Justice Trudeau, does Justin Trudeau have the moral authority to govern, govern rather? And over the next five weeks, you can be sure that I'm going to be asking that question of Canadians. Why do you think Justin Trudeau has lost the moral authority? Was well, pretty clear. I will also be putting forward our plan, a government which will live according to its means, within its means, which will put more money in the pockets of your everyday Canadians. And so that's what we're going to do. That'll be our message. And I'm sure that our message is going to resonate with Canadians and that, in fact, Canadians want a government which respects ethic laws. Do you think the RCMP should stay out of things during the election? Should it suspend its investigation? Well, look, I would call on Justin Trudeau to waive cabinet secrecy so individuals in his office can speak to the RCMP. That's my position. Do you believe the Prime Minister when he says he had nothing to do with the decision to waive cabinet confidences? Not at all. I don't believe him at all. I stopped believing him when it was proven that he lied to Canadians, when the Ethics Commissioner showed that he lied to Canadians about his role in this affair. Uh, we know that the power to waive cabinet confidential, uh, confidentiality and the power to waive privilege in this case rests with the Prime Minister. That is clear. It's within his power to do so. He should do it immediately. He should do it today. You're heading to Quebec this morning. Will you stand up for people concerned about Bill 21? I've made my uh, views on Bill 21 known. Uh, it's, uh, it's not something that our government would, uh, our party would ever consider at the federal level. We will always uh, stand up uh, for the rights of, uh, of, of Canadians and the rights for expression and the rights of uh, freedom of religion. Uh, good morning, Mr. Shear. This is Olivia Stefanovich from CBC. Uh, the Ethics Commissioner's report over the summer didn't really move the dial with voters. So do you think this latest development with SNC will? Well, again, this whole scandal isn't about moving poll numbers. This is about showing to Canadians that Justin Trudeau has lost the moral authority to govern. And clearly the RCMP are taking this seriously enough to start investigating individuals in the Prime Minister's office. And that's why it's so important that Justin Trudeau take some personal responsibility and waive that privilege. It's within his power to do so. But I'm going to make a prediction. He's going to lie about it today. He's going to continue lying about it, just like he did at the very beginning, when he looked Canadians in the eye and said that he had nothing to do with this, that the allegations were false. He then said that Jody Wilson-Raybould never came to him with her concerns. We now know that is a lie as well. He said that he was doing this because of jobs or headquarters of SNC-Lavalin. We now know that wasn't true either. From the beginning of this scandal, he has been incapable of being honest with Canadians and he has consistently been caught in his own falsehoods. He needs to do the right thing, waive the privilege. Canadians can tell that his refusal to do so means that he is, he is hiding something even worse. If he had nothing to hide, he would waive the privilege and he would let the RCMP do their work.
Oui, euh, euh, je, je vais prédire que Justin Trudeau va mentir aujourd'hui pour les raisons pour lesquelles il ne peut pas. I said, you know, Justin Trudeau was lying today, just he's been lying in the past. He has the authority to lift the whole question, deal with the whole question of cabinet confidentiality. He has refused to allow his ministers to speak. That's because he's probably hiding something that's much more serious than what we've already seen. So I'm calling on him today to lift the whole veil of cabinet secrecy. His campaign. Uh, we want to welcome everyone who is listening uh, on the Global News Radio Network across the country, watching us live on television and uh, online. I'm joined with by uh, Charles Adler from uh, the Global News Radio Network. Charles, Andrew Scheer in serious attack mode in this campaign launch, making it very clear what he thinks about Justin Trudeau and making it uh, trying to set this up, I guess, as a very stark choice in, in essentially who you believe. He wants to make it a stark choice between what he perceives to be utter dishonesty. He used the word lie just moments ago in a, in a, in a five-minute riff. He said lie six times. He wants to paint Justin Trudeau as a liar. And while Scheer wants to smile on the, on the commercials and talk about putting more money in your pockets, metaphorically speaking, I would just want to emphasize, metaphorically speaking, he wants to put Justin Trudeau behind bars. He wants the Canadian public to see Justin Trudeau as a person who might at some point be under criminal investigation and that the only reason he isn't, I'm just speaking from the point of view of what the conservative strategy is about, they're maintaining that the only reason there isn't a criminal investigation right now of Justin Trudeau by the RCMP is because Justin Trudeau abused his authority to prevent the RCMP from having access to the information they need. Very serious charge. Although we don't know what any of that would lead to, we must, <laughs> of Absolutely. course, it, it, the RCMP were poking around. There's not yeah. an official investigation underway, so the, the Tories will torque it to be absolutely the worst-case scenario, but there are still lots of questions we don't have answered about the whole snc right. Avalanche affair. That is certain. And, just, and, and that's why I keep uh, insisting that's the Tory, that's the Conservative right. strategy to portray uh, Trudeau as, as a person who should be under criminal investigation, but has abused his authority and made sure that that isn't happening. The media will keep hounding him on this. Uh, the Globe and Mail had the first question. The Globe and Mail went after him on it. And then you had Canadian press and you had others. I just don't see this question leaving. And it doesn't really matter how many times uh, Justin Trudeau tries to say that uh, this is about helping the middle class and helping kids and, and, and all the, the rest of his talking points. I honestly think that this particular story from the Globe and Mail that they broke last night at the moment is blowing away Justin Trudeau's talking points, and it's going to be headline news all day today and, and perhaps tomorrow. Well, Andrew Scheer is certainly going to town saying Justin Trudeau's a leader you cannot trust. Uh, Jagmeet Singh also saying Justin Trudeau isn't who he pretended to be. So both of his chief opponents are going to go after that relentlessly in this campaign. Donna, do you find it odd that uh, considering how vulnerable the NDP is in Quebec right now, that J Jagmeet Singh said nothing in French. He answered some questions in French. Right, yeah. but in, in, yeah. his, in his prepared remarks, <clears throat> that's why I don't think it was a mistake. It had to be deliberate mm. because he prepared remarks that were right in front of his, his face in English, N nothing in French. That seemed odd to me. Yeah, interesting. I want to ask you about um, the whole idea of political leadership and promises. Because throughout this campaign, Canadians are going to be listening to a whole host of promises. We heard some from Jagmeet Singh today, uh, uncosted. So his ideas of, you know, national pharmacare and dental care and vision care and mental health care and affordable housing and uh, all sounds fantastic. But there's no price tag attached to it at this point. We know from the last campaign that Justin Trudeau made a lot of promises. First past the post. Remember that? He yeah, said no. so many <laughs> times, this is going to be the last first yeah. past the post election. Here we are in 2019 and we're back at a first past the post election. He promised a balanced budget um, and, and even a surplus. Yeah. yeah and that, that, that went out the yeah. window. At what point do you sense among listeners to your radio show that there is a malaise, a sense that politicians just say a bunch of stuff and we can't really trust any of them? You know, Daryl Bricker will tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth in terms of issues and how people respond to what their most important issues in life are as a Canadian. Health care, uh, climate change, obviously affordability and, and some others, taxes. However, 
when I talk to my listeners, especially the listeners in Western Canada, whether I'm talking to them on the phone, whether they're messaging me on, on Twitter, Facebook, it really doesn't matter. When my listeners are communicating with me, trust in Justin Trudeau is at a low right now. And I do think that's why Sheer is picking up on that. That is Justin Trudeau's primary vulnerability, not just about SNC-Lavalin, but all these other broken promises. The, the question for Canadians, and it, it might be the ballot question, can you trust the Prime Minister for another four years? Well, yeah, I wonder, <clears throat> I wonder too, if the ballot question might be just who, who can you trust? Oh. When, when people are going in to make that final decision, who do I believe anymore, right? Because there are so many broken promises on all fronts. So uh, I don't want to sound like there's a lot of, you know, cynicism here, but <laughs> I am hungry for political leaders to yeah. stop attacking their opponents and start presenting the, a case on, on, for why they should be elected. And not, and, not and, to defend the politicians, but if they had strong enough personalities and strong enough credibility with the public, Donna, I think they'd be making that case. I honestly think the reason they keep going negative is because their negatives are rather high with the public and they feel that's the only way for them to get ahead is to push down mm. the other guy. Mm. All right. Let's thanks so much, Charles. Let's go to our uh, panel of strategists. I'm interested in their takes on this. Richard Mahoney, wh what is it about um, a kind of you know, malaise about leadership and who you can trust as a politician. Um, are we in a, in a bit of a crisis, do you think, when it comes to that? I don't know that we're in a crisis, Donna, but I do think your point's uh, well taken. I, I think Canadians are skeptical about uh, politicians and what they say and what they do and whether they'll say everything they say what they will do. Even politicians with the best of intentions uh, when they run for office and, and make commitments to their constituents uh, find out when they get in office that, that maybe it's not so easy to make the changes that, that, that they said. The other thing I think you're putting your, your, your finger on here is um, politicians will, you and Charles have been pointing it out, politicians will say lots of things uh, to get elected. Mr. Scheer uh, there was making some rather, um, let's call them exaggerated claims and uh, in uh, impolite company that would that could be called lies. Canadians are skeptical, I think, about that from all politicians. Uh, and I think we're also skeptical not just about our politicians, but about all the institutions in our society and whether or not they're organized in a way that helps us uh, get by and so forth. So it's part of a larger trend. It's a concerning one. It's not good for Canadian politics that that's there. But I would say this, I don't think it's particularly new. Uh, I don't think that's unique to this set of politicians or this leadership. Well, yes, I know it's not new. You're absolutely right about that. I just long for a time when we can listen to party platforms and not listen to attacks on what, what the other leader has done wrong over and over and over again. I, that's what I, I, I guess what I, Fred Delory, let me ask you what you think the tone of this campaign will be um, fairly negative out of the blocks today. Um, is that what we can expect? Lots of attacks? Well, campaigns take on a life of their own as they go. Um, as we've seen today, this wasn't the plan, I'm sure of it. Uh, there was no, uh, this morning, um, Mr. Shear would prefer to be talking about his platform and his plan, but this news story is quite significant. So that shifts it. And at the same time, it is important that politicians do take on these issues and contrast themselves. You can't only talk about your plan. You do have to compare it to the other plans and to the other leaders. So it is it is a part of, uh, of the campaign. Um, how, how the tone will go throughout this campaign, we'll have to see. I mean, it could all go away fairly easily if Mr. Trudeau just lets these people speak to the RCMP and gives the documents as requested. How much do you think um, trust might be the ballot question? The leader, which leader can you trust? It, it, again, it, it depends how this campaign evolves. If, if that's the case, if, it, if that becomes the ballot question, Mr. Scheer is going to be in wonderful shape to get a, a very large majority government, uh, by the way, day one is looking. Uh, but again, um, a lot is going to happen in the next 40 days. Sure will. Okay, Fred Delory, um, thank you so much. We're going to go to Victoria now. Uh, Elizabeth May, leader of the Green Party, is kicking off her campaign there. Let's listen in. Now. So everyone in this room, what do we say? Yes! Yes! Merci! Kaishka! To all of you, à tous et tous 
Ici dans ce salon, je veux dire un grand merci pour I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for participating so early in the morning. We started with a territorial acknowledgement before we went to national television, but I want to say again how honored I am to stand on unceded territory of the Songhees, of the Esquimalt, of the Coast Salish people of this territory on which we are honored to live. I also, je veux dire quelques mots aussi en français. And I'm going to speak briefly in French about indigenous rights. It's a somber day for me. Uh, September 11th is a hard day because my kids were in New York at the time and it's a big trauma. Uh, so it, it is the day we're launching the campaign. So all my love and all my thoughts to everyone touched by the tragedy 18 years ago, September 11th, and a particular big shout out to Sasha and Christy. I love you guys. It's a tough day, but I'm off to the races and I got to do it. So there you go. Um, <laughs> This is the most important election in Canadian history. This is a chance for Canada and for Canadian citizens to decide, maybe for the first time in their lives, the first time in our lives, that what matters most is that we vote for what we believe in and vote for what we want. What Greens will do in this campaign, all of the candidates standing with me here on stage. Oh, hey, student climate strikers, come up here and join us. Come up here, kid. Get up here. Our pledge, our pledge as adults is that we will never abandon our children. Le Parti Vert sait faire un grand engagement the Green pour protéger Party la is committed pour to protect the future for our children and our grandchildren. And this is not up for negotiation, period. We are committed to protect our society, our planet, our nature, and our children. We have to act against climate change. This election is about telling the truth to Canadians about how serious the climate emergency really is. And we do that in order not to create fear. We do that in order to give everyone hope. We have a plan. We know this is a climate emergency. And we don't just use the words without understanding their meaning. How could we in Parliament have passed a motion June 17th that we're in a climate emergency and the next day our government committed to spend $13 billion on the Trans Mountain Pipeline to drive up greenhouse gases. We will continue to stand firm. We will hold the line. No one can dissuade us from seeing clearly that we need to move away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. And that's mission possible. Nous avons un plan, il s'appelle So we have a plan. It's called Mission Possible, and it is possible. We can eliminate our dependence on fossil fuels. And to in, in the time that we need to do it, we have like 12 to 15 years to do so. We have no choice. Greenhouse gases along the timeline that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has given us. To do this, we have to jettison partisanship. What has blocked us from action since 1992 when Canada signed the Framework Convention on Climate Change? It's been petty, short-term political considerations that clouded the thought processes of people who knew better. It's time for every so-called leader of every party to join us and accept the targets that are driven by science, not by politics, driven by courage, not by fear, driven by hope for our children's future and an, an absolutely solid resolve that nothing matters more than ensuring our children and grandchildren can live out their natural lifetimes in this beautiful country with a civilization that supports us. So it's now that we have to commit ourselves to an overall society project 
it's clear we have to work together in a non-partisan fashion, period. We have to work hard to make sure, just like we did during the Second World War, work together. We need an internal cabinet that can that absolutely commits across party lines to doing what we have to do. We can transform our economy. <laughs> We can transform our economy. We can move to a, an economy with 100% renewable energy, feeding an electricity grid. Our national infrastructure energy needs are not pipelines. It's a Canadian grid strategy to ensure creating way more jobs than any other party has talked about. We'll have millions of jobs created in retrofitting all our buildings for energy efficiency, in building that east, west, and north electricity grid, in turning over and shutting down fossil fuels, and turning on the sun, the wind, the tides, the streams. We can be 100% renewable energy by 2030. It's a job we have to do. And to be clear, to be very clear, that means no new pipelines, banning fracking. We don't need a single new piece of fossil fuel infrastructure, but we do need to protect Canadian workers. We'll do that by starting by cutting off the foreign oil. And given the human rights record of Saudi Arabia, I won't mind one bit telling Mr. Irving he can't get by Saudi oil anymore for the St. John, New Brunswick refinery, and we'll find him a source from Hibernia instead. Our agenda is big. It is human rights. It's also social justice. It is universal pharmacare. It is child care. It is making sure that our students don't have to pay tuition anymore and our universities don't have to go cap in hand to ask corporations to give them chairs in the area of corporate profits for that industry. That's over. We are clear as Greens. We understand fully well that we have to eliminate the hold that our transnational corporations have on our society. It's perverse. And it is, in fact, what a lot of regulators refer to the industry they regulate as their clients. We are the clients of the government of Canada. We are the owners of the government of Canada. We are the citizens of this country. And as citizens of this country, we demand that our government works for us, not for them. And we know that we cannot achieve a world that's safe and secure for our children and ignore injustice. That's why at the center of everything we do will be respect for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and a fight, a real fight for reconciliation that we will not give up till every kid. We also stand for something else. We are earlier talking about how hard we work. We're a hard-working crew. No, that's my, that's my bells are telling me. We are a hard-working crew. Every single Green Party candidate across this country is prepared to roll up their sleeves and work to get it done for our kids, for our friends, for our neighbors, for Greta Thunberg. When Greta says the house is on fire, the appropriate response from grown-up leadership is to say, all of the little ones, go out quickly and get to safety. We've got this. We'll call 911. We'll put out the fire. We'll deal with this. And the people in this country who don't understand this is serious, if I have to, I'm going to throw you over my shoulders and take you out of the burning building, because we're going to save you too. <laughs> Canadians, I ask you to consider 
how much happier you'll be with your vote when you know you're voting for a candidate, a party, and a leader who has your back, who earns your trust, who never lets you down, who never makes a promise we can't keep. All of our promises are being costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office. All of them. No other party can say that. We are going to present our platform, and we're going to present the budget after PBO finishes with it. We gave them the numbers in June, by the way. It's taking a while. We have a lot of things we're committed to, including what I've mentioned in terms of pharmacare and universal child care and making sure that we can bring in a guaranteed livable income by mid-century so we eliminate poverty in this country for good. We are committed to protect our society, to protect the future, to protect all the workers who are currently concerned about the future. Best equipped, most blessed of people on the planet, because we're Canadians and we believe in our heart of hearts as Greens that by working together across party lines and asking Canadians to think about, if you really want to change how things look, please change your vote and elect a green government to Canada. Thank you. Question over here. I think it's it's Mel. Mel ask your question, Melanie. Melanie, I've been with you on long day before. Felt the excitement, the momentum. In the end, in the past, it didn't materialize. There were seats. What's going to be done differently this time? Uh, is it? Are you going to take votes from the NDP? Is it climate change going to resonate more? How are you going to lock down the votes this time? Yeah, Greens don't split votes. Greens grow votes. And we are going to be earning the vote of every Canadian who's sick of their old choices, or more likely, who's motivated by recognizing that the climate emergency we saw in 2015 is now multiple climate emergencies from coast to coast to coast. We need to act. We need to act in a way that reflects my seriousness of purpose. This is not a campaign slogan. It's not a short-term commitment. It's something that upon which the whole world could depend on Canadian leadership if only we got our act together, because right now we are laggards. So what's different from last time? Well, for one thing, we have a lot more Greens elected across Canada, official opposition in Prince Edward Island, Paul Manley elected in Nanaimo Ladysmith. We have a stronger base across this country with more volunteers ready to elect Greens in New Brunswick, in Nova Scotia, in Prince Edward Island, in Quebec, and a lot in British Columbia. So we're pretty excited. Oh, uh, and Ontario, sorry, Ontario. Woo! Go Guelph, go Steve Dick. I did not forget Ontario. Yes, sorry. Uh, Richard Sussman, Globe News. I think people are confused over the last week of what we've seen from some green candidates across the country around issues on a women's right to choose, yeah. as well as on separation in Quebec. As a leader, would you stand for candidates? who believe that Quebec should separate from Canada and that uh, the women should not have the right to choose around abortion. I'm glad you asked the question, Richard, because I've never been so baffled by questions about things about which I thought I've been clear for forever. The Green Party is 100% solid that we will not retreat one inch from a woman's right to a legal and safe abortion ever. That is a commitment. <laughs> We will not let candidates break a sacred pledge. And every MP who signs the, as Paul and I have done, signs the role to become an MP, takes an oath to support, defend, and protect Canada. I don't know how the blockists get around that in their head, but I won't let any of my candidates get around it in their head. It's a pledge. I'm the only, there are only two members of parliament who've been honored with the Order of Canada. I'm one of them. I will fight for my country, and there is no risk whatsoever that a Green MP would fight for separation. We fight for Canada. But how can that be on the ballot? How can your 
Mantel was a separatist beyond the ballot as he. As far as I know, in all my conversations with him, he's not a separatist. He's a strong Quebecer within the context of Canada. I listened to his interview with the Quebec radio station many times listening, and he kept saying, I'm a strong Quebecer in the context of Canada. So we will, I'll be talking to Pierre to make sure because we will not have a candidate who thinks they can work to break up our country. That's not on. We are first and, well, first and foremost, no other, no other party leader is going to say this, but are you ready? First and foremost, we are earthlings. <laughs> we have... And I know there's some, there's some billionaires who want to go to Mars and start a settlement. I think we want to do a GoFundMe campaign and send them now. So we, but in all seriousness, we are British Columbians in this room. We are strong British Columbians. But we believe Canada is a family. I loathe the strategies that have been going on between Alberta and BC provincially to make people think we're different. We love Albertans. They're our family. We love Albertans. Eh? Nous, nous aimons profondément. And we profoundly love our Quebec family. I love speaking in French. I do the best I can. I'm not great at it, but I love the sound of the language and I love the Quebec ambiance and culture. I mean, you know, I'm not perfectly bilingual, but I'm making uh, my best effort. It's very clear the Green Party is in Quebec for Quebec. We love Quebecers very deeply, but in, we're all part of the same family. We're a part of the same Canadian family. Yes. Mark, just so you know, I'm not. The greatest opportunity, but also the greatest scrutiny that you've ever faced. Are you ready for that? It doesn't feel so much like scrutiny, it's much more like a hazing, honestly, Christine. But uh, I'm more than ready. We are, listen, I'm a seasoned campaigner. I have more experience campaigning than any of the other leaders. I watched their QAs after their prepared statements. And uh, I mean, mine had a lot of preparation. I may have thought of it while Paul was talking, actually, my statement. <laughs> We don't duck questions, we answer them honestly. Sometimes my honest answers run on too long. I am not prepared to change the way I speak or the way our candidates are encouraged to be themselves. That's all I ask of our candidates. Tell the truth, be yourself, work hard, and be nice to the other guys. Because we live on the high road, we don't go low. So when we get attacked, okay, S clarify, explain what's true, explain what our policies are, and move on because we've got real issues to talk about, and these are distractions. It's important to stand up and make it clear that we condemn racism. It's important to stand up and say, when we say we don't whip votes, that's because we believe in democracy. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, green parties around the world do this. We work by consensus. We listen to each other. We trust each other. And as I think is evident up here, right across 338 candidates across Canada, we love each other. Yeah. We are a family too, and we want to make sure that, uh, I certainly want as leader, my job is to be the chief spokesperson, we deliberately made it as the Green Party of Canada was founded on the same principles as Greens around the world, a leader can never be a dictator. A leader can't be in it for power for themselves. A leader is in it in the principles of servant leadership to work for this country as hard as we can. That's the job. So things have been taken out of context for sure. I hope I can put it all to bed right now, repeating once again, all candidates, you want to put your hand up on your heart? Put your hand on your heart. We will never allow any retreat from a woman's right to a safe and legal abortion. We right? All right, we're going to break we away from Elizabeth ever. May now. Our uh, Richard Zussman is in the room there in Victoria. Richard, she is the veteran campaigner in this election. She's been leader of the Green Party since 2011. She certainly seems the most upbeat of all the leaders who launched today. What's your sense of her campaign strategy? 
Yeah, Don, the campaign strategy is to get in front of as many Canadians as possible, but to really focus here on Vancouver Island, where they believe they can have a major breakthrough based on the polls they've been seeing and focus on the other side of the country. You heard Elizabeth May there mention the provinces in which the Greens have elected provincial representatives, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, one in Ontario, and obviously three here in BC where they hold the balance of power. You're also going to see a lot of off-the-cuff remarks from May. She's less polished in a sense than the other leaders, but she believes that allows her to connect more closely with Canadians. All right, Richard Zussman uh, with the Green Party uh, campaign in Victoria. Thank you. We look forward to following that entire campaign. And uh, we're going to wrap up now. Just get some final thoughts from our Charles Adler uh, from Global Radio News Network. Uh, Charles, your thoughts on where we're headed. 40 days ahead of us, we're going to get a lot of information thrown at us. Canadians at the end of the day have to make a choice. How do you think the campaign is shaping up? It's shaping up uh, to me, Donna, based on everything we saw today as two campaigns. One, an incredibly hostile, negative campaign, Sheer versus Trudeau. Okay? That's sort of the, the main event. The other event is, for some people, just as interesting, and that's the event aimed at the progressive voters who do not want to vote for the Liberals. And that's Elizabeth May versus Jagmeet Singh. And Elizabeth May is, for the people who've been watching the last few minutes, they don't have to have you or me tell them, Elizabeth May is all passion, she's all conviction, she's all fun, she's all in, and she says she's not fully bilingual, which she isn't, but she did speak in both languages in her prepared remarks. Jagmeet Singh did not. That'll be analyzed today, probably to death, maybe too much. But the point is, Elizabeth May wants to be seen as the national progressive leader of the Green Party, and I think she did the best today as far as presentation. And she has made it clear just very quickly, she doesn't want to form a majority government. That's She no. realizes that's pie in the sky. Possibly minority, holding the balance of power, could give the Green Party a lot of sway. Well, you know, she's speaking today in, in Victoria, and as Richard Zussman of our crew in British Columbia said, uh, she, according to polls, is looking at a major breakthrough on Vancouver Island. If she gets a breakthrough there and she gets a, a few breakthroughs and a few breaks in other parts of the country, she could be holding the balance of power. All right, Charles Adler, thanks. 40 days ahead. Uh, that concludes our Global News special coverage of the 43rd federal election call. It's the politicians of making their pitches. It's our job to help you sift through all of it and make a decision, whether you're watching on a local global station, listening on radio, or following us online. Thanks for watching and listening. Bye-bye. This has been a special presentation from Global News.